thanks for inviting me. It's, been, it's a pleasure to be here. Always love coming to Holland. Uh, coming from Germany originally, I can tell you that it's quite a different spirit here for some reason or the other. But now I live in Switzerland, which is uh, by, any, uh, by any definition a, an interesting place that is morphing very quickly. I'll show you some examples of what entails with what's happening in Switzerland. Now, um, I worked as a musician for a long time. So I, uh, I worked in the music business from 1995 to about 2004 uh, as a futurist, helping to try to help the music business understand what's happening. And needless to say, of course, this is the worst place in the world to, in the, in the world to work, is the music business, really, because their sense of the future is about the uh, one click away from the download of iTunes. Uh, it, so I have some similar comparisons to what's happening with academic and the universities, which I will uh, try to expose you to. Uh, I then did a lot of work on the future of business. So I have over 100 clients in the, uh, in the business space, software technology, ranging from Google to Sony to many others. And uh, as about two years ago, I, uh, I thought that there's more important uh, topics than uh, creating more money for, uh, for the incumbents of the world. So I've branched out into what I call the future of humanity. Uh, this is a slightly ambitious topic, of course, as you, as you can say. So um, what I want to talk to you about today is the future of knowledge at the intersection of digital and sustainability. Uh, most of my material is avail available for free downloads at futuristgert.com. So you don't actually have to take a photo of each slide. You'd be very busy if you did that. Um, I also have a, a, a file sharing website using Dropbox. Some of you may know <coughs> Dropbox called GERD Cloud, which is of course a joke. G-E-R-D cloud.com links you to my download directory on Dropbox and it's three gigabytes of my books and everything is available there. So uh, my company, The Futures Agency, is based in uh, Switzerland and also in San Francisco, and our motto is it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. <laughs> so for a lot of our clients, uh, you can see some of them there, this is what we do. We show them what rain is coming, and they have to reinvent themselves in the process. And uh, again, this is a cloud on my website if you want to go there. So, uh, the way I distinguish my own work as a futurist, which some of you may not even know what a futurist is, um, I didn't know what a futurist was until I became one. That's, I guess, the best transition. Um, I work on foresights, so I don't work on predictions. Uh, I work on pretty much the obvious things, really, but I spend all my time working one step beyond the obvious, you know, the next three to five years. And I like to summarize this and say that I work on the OS, the operating system, not the app. And so the app is, for example, Google Maps. So I don't work on Google Maps. I work on the overall system of the app, of the, of the operating system. So first, uh, I think this is the key question we're talking about the future of learning and training and work, of course. What is the future of the human OS, the human operating system? There's a key question here is that's, of course, emerging with the tremendous pro progress in technology that is changing what we do, for example, Take simply the use of mobile phones, which has changed our society globally in a very quick way. You're sitting at the bar now, and if the discussion comes up about the capital of Mongolia, you can look it up. Right? It's like having an outside brain. And this outside brain is now moving inside, which uh, Yuri, if he shows up, will actually tell us about the advent of the overlap of technology. And what does a social contract look like here? Whether it is possible for a professor to get a Wikipedia implant, which is already possible. That's just a little bit cumbersome, but in five years it could be entirely normal. <coughs> Think about this for a second, right? If you have a Wikipedia on your desk, that's, that's good. If you can have it on Google Glass, which essentially is a, a glass holding a remote control internet access and projecting onto your iris, that's better. The next step is the implant. And that's coming. So if a professor has a Wikipedia implant, does it make him a better professor? And how about those that don't have it? 40% of Brazilian women have their bodies augmented. You can imagine what that means. 40%. So as a Brazilian woman, you're a disadvantage if you don't have this stuff. This is a very probable question. So we're facing a future where we're saying, OK, uh, clearly there's going to be lots of disruptions in education. You can ask the question, Will it be similar to what happened in the music business or to publishing? If you're a record company, most artists will today say, you know, do we need you? 
And why did we ever need you? Newspapers, you know, are in steep decline. Most countries, 30-40% decline in subscriptions and, of course, advertising revenues. Will the same thing happen to academia, education, learning, training? So a couple of examples, you know, this, this idea of uh, copy and paste in mass education. You know, you go to university, just copy and paste into your brain. I tried this. I went to several universities, uh, first in theology and then in music. And the copy and paste process worked pretty well, but it didn't make me a better musician. <laughs> so there are questions about this, you know, that are starting to erupt. And of course, you know, you know that there's hundreds of websites now providing free education, including the Khan Academy and Coursera, and you know, mind problem. You should try it sometime because it's really quite enlightening. Thailand is putting people on the internet uh, by giving them free tablets. In Brazil, there's a debate about buying a hundred million tablet computers. For, for all of the students in Brazil, which are many of and they will cost five dollars each. So how would that change education? The flipped classroom, education in the cloud. If you go to Korea, you already have English teachers who are robots. And you're in the classroom, the kids in the classroom speak to a robot. And it's normal, parenthesis. Well, it's Korea, right? But still. Stanford University on iTunes. So we are shifting into a world where we are shifting away from this industrial mindset of mechanical dealings in the age of mechanical progress, now moving into a digital time frame that is exponential. Okay, exponential means you're not counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you're counting 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Moore's law, exponential growth of technology. So when you think about this today, the mobile phone has become a standard only 10 years ago, it wasn't so. Now, Michael Douglas in the first movie that featured a mobile phone, the phone was this big, it was suitable for killing people. <laughs> now the phones are this small and the tiniest phones actually fit in your ear. And there's already again, there's phones that are implants, just like you can have an implant for having a hearing problem. Okay. So digital and exponential is really a mind boggling shift and you can safely say that we're heading into a knowledge revolution. Now, I would distinguish greatly here between knowledge and wisdom, right? or experience for that matter. But still, I mean, if you look at data, information, I mean, now I have to actually remember things. So when I'm a doctor um, cruising around and, and doing my checkups on my patients, I have to remember this guy has this kind of cancer, and I had two other guys that also had this kind of cancer. So I can use this information now, but when I'm a doctor using IBM Watson that walks next to me, which is starting to be reality now, this computer has access to 157,000 cases of the same cancer, and standing right next to me, I have my second brain with me, so to speak. It changes my perspective. So this is really about data. As a financial analyst, you can go and sit down today and you can scrape the world websites for information about companies that should be buy or sell on the stock market. Now we can actually use software that is a smart, intelligent robot, essentially, that crawls the web and comes back with the answers. I don't know if you've tried Google Now or Siri on your iPhone. You can ask questions, for example, like I'll, uh, I'll give you some examples later. For example, you know, what is the sense of living? And Siri will give you an answer. You should try it out sometimes. So the knowledge revolution also brings a work revolution. This is Paul Saffo's company in San Francisco talking about what's happening to work, for example, the rising importance of social intelligence, of computational thinking, cognitive load management, design mindset, all of those skills that we really don't learn at school. I mean, you know, I teach lots of business schools and I, I'm amazed of none of this is actually happening in there. This is all mechanics. So, we're also facing an inevitable change of paradigm. Uh, we're sort of at the end of this hyper-capitalism spiral. I mean, it's not hard to see that our basic principle of growth at all costs is kind of dooming us. So now we're entering an age of what I call the biosphere, which essentially is saying that uh, we, can, we can progress, but it has to be in a connected way. So we have huge corporations like Unilever and Procter and Gamble and many others who are saying that what's more important is what's called the triple bottom line approach, people, planet, profit, becoming the new paradigm of capitalism. 
I'll talk more about it in a second, what that has to do with academia. But Alvin Toffler, a great futurist, says there's been three waves. The first is the agricultural revolution, then the industrial revolution, and now we have the knowledge revolution. So we're in the middle of this knowledge revolution. So the question again I have is for universities and educational institutions, will it be like the regular labels? I don't think so, really. But there are some interesting parallels, of course, that we should investigate. But what's happening now, you may know this movie by Tiffany Schlein called Connected, which I recommend you watch. Connected, the movie it's called. I think you can actually watch it for free on YouTube. Uh, when she talks about what's happening is uh, that our entire ecosystem of what we do is becoming interdependent. Just 20 years ago, every company, uh, every country wanted to be independent. Like Switzerland, where I live, you know, their independence is it. It's basically, that's their paradigm of life. But of course, it's turning out now that it's actually not workable. Because in a vastly connected system, digitally connected network society, we're becoming interdependent. Give an example, in Switzerland, we <coughs> have decided not to have nuclear power. But it's meaningless, right? because across the border from France, 20 miles from where I live, are four power plants that all have problems. But we can't tell the French people what to do. So it's all interdependent now. And basically, I think if you were totally independent, maybe greed or hypercapitalism is OK. Because you're not doing much damage except for yourself. Of course, you could argue that, really. History has proved that's not quite true. But in an interdependent system, ego systems are disastrous. Because they, they spread the damage. So this we have to consider when we think about education. When we're doing away with some of the things that we've been looking at in the past, what kind of unintended <coughs> consequences are we producing? Just like nuclear power, the unintended consequence being is that we can't actually stop it once it goes wrong. So are we willing to consider this? I think this, you know, as I'm writing my book called From Ego to Eco, I'm working on my next book, will be available sometime next year, called From Ego to Eco. We're looking at this system saying, and this is a big fundamental shift in society and culture, and of course in business and technology, is going from the ego system. This would be, for example, Apple. Apple is basically my way or the highway. I mean, I'm, I'm an Apple user, I love Apple stuff, but that's what, that's what they are. It's a, it's a nicely closed board guard. Works great, but the future is moving in this direction where we're becoming more like an ecosystem rather than an ecosystem. <coughs> That's true, you know, in general, I think the implications for universities are severe. Because in many ways you could argue that universities have been quite good at this as well. Some have and some have not, I mean, depending on where you're looking. Right? But this is a big shift in terms of what we have to look at for our future. And, and I think it's quite obvious when you're talking uh, to people who are thinking about the future of education that this is becoming the paradigm. Because also, of course, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system so that we can show each other what to learn. Mm -hmm. But is that enough? It's like Twitter. You know, guys, if you guys are Twitter users, you know what I'm talking about. It's phenomenal, all the stuff you can find there. And it takes 23 seconds for the news to arrive on Twitter. It takes four hours, 50 minutes on television because you have to go there with a the camera. But, you know, the noise is definite. I mean, what is it, 250 million tweets in 10 minutes or something like that? So, you know, a giant fire hose. So, I think basically what we're looking at is that our ecosystem of education and others will be based on a value circle, not a value chain. You know, when you study business, which I hope, thankfully I didn't, uh, <laughs> So then it talks about value chains. You know, how one thing goes to the other and then it creates a nice system. Right? But I'm talking about value circles. How we can interconnect with others and to create value for each other and then replenish the system. The key point is, when you have an ecosystem where you take out more than you put in, eventually it crashes. That's the music business, that's publishing, energy, transportation. So that's sort of the top level thing. Now I want to talk about machines and, and humans. The story of science fiction movies for the last 20 years 
has been exactly this, which is becoming very much reality now. I mean, everything, everything you see in Blade Runner, Minority Report, Matrix, or Total Recall, or whatever movies you like, is to some extent already reality. Look no further than the NSA and the prison scandals, right? the surveillance, which we think sounds like straight out of a science fiction movie. That a guy can sit on the beach in Hawaii and look out my email and draw conclusions and put a flag on my profile. You know, after having had a drink, of course. <coughs> so, dramatic evolution here, we're talking about this idea of machine thinking. <coughs> because we have machine thinking and then we have thinking machines, you know, we, we kind of have both. But I want to talk about the difference here. But what's, what's happened in terms of interfaces is that the computing that used to be on outside of our body, the typing now has become sort of a lean-in experience by being able to speak to the computer, which is the next big evolution or to gesture it, like you see uh, Tom Cruise doing a minority report, going inside of the data and taking it out. That's reality already for many doctors and others. Right? To where we're moving inside of the machine ourselves, which is the logical conclusion. And to some degree, you know, degree the rise of the singularity that Yuri will talk about. So, the question is, where does this lead us? And I think the big danger here is that we're thinking of people or of human processes like machine processes. For example, we can clearly see the rise of social media, which I use a lot and I'm thankful for, has resulted in an average 20% increase of work. People work 20% more because they're even more connected. It makes perfect sense, right? But it's turning us into a machine to some degree, a perpetual hamster. You know? creating a hedonic treadmill. You know, I like you, you like me, and I'm always busy doing something or the other because it's a, it's a, it's a cycle. Right? So this is something we have to think about. What is the machine thinking going to be? And are we going to have thinking sentient machines? The, the flip of this, right? So machine thinking as humans, and thinking machines as machines. And how will they overlap? I mean, this is very important for education because you can tell a software robot to go out and tell me all about Brazil. And it will do a much better job than I could do myself by searching. I mean, the, the very idea of searching on Google and then learning something is completely old-fashioned. I mean, we all do it, but clearly, if I can tell a software robot to go and fetch the most important thing for me because the system knows me, they know I like food, they know I like beaches, whatever, so it comes back with relevant information in four seconds. That's, we already have that. So back in those days, Star Trek, Spock had a thing called the tricorder. The tricorder would basically do a diagnosis and also heal people on the fly. You may remember if you're as old as I am, otherwise you should check it out anyway. But now we got this, this guy here, I forgot his name, I think it's Andraka. He's about to work on a tricorder challenge sponsored by Qualcomm for $15 million to invent such a machine, and it's in progress. This machine could analyze my physical state using a blood prick and a coughing into it that would be equal to 10 doctors and that do it quicker and cheaper and remotely, <laughs> becoming reality. What would this device do in Africa? when the doctor can receive input from 500 of these devices and provide remote assistance. Or say, no, you don't have malaria, you have this. So this will change the world in our good mobile devices are already our second brain. And this means a lot for education, think about this. My son, who's 18, he's very much into languages, thank God. But you know, the next thing is going to be automatic translation. That's already working. I mean, if you've tried Google Translate, that's primitive. Now, try the stuff that Google has in the labs, which I did. You can speak in German, and it comes out in Chinese in real time. <coughs> Docomo in Japan has an app that you can download for your mobile phone where you speak in any language, and it brings, comes out on the other end in real time in Japanese. That's 98% after it. So as a student, you can read anything, you can say anything, it comes out in any which way you want on the other end in the next two or three years. So, 
That changes the way that we learn because we figure, you know, why do I learn Hebrew if I study theology? Not needed. I mean, if, in fact, I probably don't have to speak at all. So I can just think. <laughs> <laughs> think about the consequence. So the question is, are we literally blindsided by technology when we do this? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll put this forward for discussion. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've seen these scenes, you know, everywhere. Of course, that people are, you know, rather than talking to their, to their partners, they're talking to their mobile phones, and they're happy to communicate with anything that has a keyboard. But, so, there are questions about this. I think, ultimately, if you look at what's happening now, is 3D printing, for example. Mm -hmm. How that will change the world of manufacturing. People talking about a half a billion jobs being lost as a consequence. A 3D printer picks up a design of something on the internet and prints a product like tennis shoes from a composite material. So you just put the stuff in, and it's getting more fancy by the minute, and then it prints it according to an intricate design, a CAT design, computer-aided design that you download, prints your product. And now there's printers that can print printers. <laughs> what will that do for the world at large? I mean, thinking, imagining, shaping, and clicking to print. <coughs> Okay, back to education and uh, universities. This is a short clip. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> this is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Well, you've seen the movie. But I believe that technology is not about making this choice. I mean, if, if we have to live in a world where we decide to be on the grid or off the grid, we have no choice. You've got to be off the grid, you can move to the Amish country. I mean, it's not feasible. And this is precisely why we shouldn't have to make the choice between surveillance and security. It's a stupid idea. I'm going to take the red pill or the blue pill. We have to figure out a compromise. And the question is about technology really is, technology really has no such vector. It's really an it depends world. So if you are a disabled person, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could have a brain interface where you don't need to speak or use your hands, or if you're quadriplegic, you could walk. It's possible. But for a soldier, to have such an interface so you can lift a car and throw it up in the air. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense for, for the soldier and for the military, right? But it's the same application. So the question is, for technology, is that it depends on how we use it. And that, of course, depends on ethics. Right? It does not depend on technology. Yes, in theory, you can have the world's knowledge in your brain in 20 years easy, possible. But what will that do, I think, ultimately, is a question of balance. So, in general, of course, technology has driven us to the point to where it's quite obvious, using Paul Barron's network topology from 1964, is that we moved from a world that was centralized, in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of media, for example, or banking, or whatever, government, to a world that's more loose. So YouTube would sort of qualify for this, you know, distributed, and a world that's liquid where all the nodes are the same. Now, if you're thinking about the future and you're saying, OK, pick one of those three. That's not our future. Just like we will watch the state television, which is centralized, for news in the future, we will have a distributed system like Netflix, and we will watch each other's stuff on Facebook. That's liquid. We'll have all of those. But it has significant impact on the TV station, what we do on Facebook, how we do this. Just like that, it will be for universities, where we are figuring out how can we actually emerge those concepts. But is the centralized unit worth less, or is it useless because we're connected? My answer will be no. In a hopeful way, of course. The Huffington Post bloggers, and in general bloggers, are not putting away the top writers of the New York Times. 
but they're certainly endangering the business model. So there are issues that we have to look at together later. I think, again, it's not either or, it's, it depends. So McKinsey published a great report on disruption. You can download this McKinsey, uh, McKinsey Global Institute. It's 85 pages, uh, so it's an easy read while you're uh, having coffee. Um, number two, they're talking about the automation of knowledge work. It's completely obvious that this is what we're facing because technology is becoming so powerful, we can easily send somebody out to create knowledge. I mean, knowledge in the sense of data, right? So artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural user interfaces, big data, smart learning, diagnostics, blah, blah, blah. They talk about several trillion dollars worth of impact on this kind of technology. We will never, as humans, beat this. We will never beat a machine stacked up with this kind of knowledge, because that's not what we do. We don't have more in five minutes. Wow, I really have to rush that quickly. OK, so what we're facing here is a, a coming decline of what are called the uh, information monopolies. And you know, starting with television, of course, people are not watching stuff over the internet. But the real question is, when we do this, what is going to happen to uh, plans of sort of what I call information superiority? Only we know this, becoming essentially unfeasible. When I talked to my bank about giving me investment advice, right, it used to be that only they have the data. And only they spend all day poking around trying to find deals. Well, we all know A, they lied. <laughs> and B, I can find it myself. It doesn't make me smarter than a doctor, but it certainly makes me more informed, for example, when I apply this to medicine. So it's no longer a sustainable advantage to have information superiority, to have this place of saying, only here you can find this. That's true for information, but not for wisdom. Right? And let's make a differentiation between the two. Okay. Check out Google now. We all need a lot of information to get through our day. So wouldn't it be cool if it was just there for you, right when you needed it? Introducing Google Now for iOS. The right information at just the right time. On your way to work each morning, Google Now shows you the fastest way to get there. When you're heading to the airport, get live updates about your flight. And as soon as you land, check. You have to try this out. It works on pretty much any mobile phone. But Google Now takes all of your private information, your Gmail, your docs, whatever you have, and anticipates what you need. Artificial intelligence. Think about Google Ed saying that you're going to have to learn how to do X, Y, Z. Here it is, and it's free. What will that do, that do to our traditional instruction? Of course, you know, as I said before, knowledge is one thing and data is one thing, but really what we want here is, you know, how can you learn wisdom? I mean, this is really what we need in the end. We don't need, I mean, we, we need data, but you know, data is data, it's commodity. Being smart is not a commodity, or having wisdom, right? that's different, but that's a human trait, that's not a machine trait. So what are we going to do about this connection? And let's consider one interesting idea of the cyber server that uh, Jaron Lanier has mentioned in his new book, called, what is it called again, Who Owns the Future? Uh, Jaron talks, he's a cyberspace pioneer, you may know him. He's talking about this concept of uh, internet companies becoming essentially super servers that are doing all the stuff for free that used to be paid for. So for example, if I, I'm just now in the process of, of dumping Google because of this whole debate about privacy, and it's going to cost me about 3,000 euros a year to get rid of Google. Because it's so good at doing that for free. But in return, I'm the data slave, right? I'm giving my data to Google, and Google is one of my clients. It's a sensitive area. Clearly, but this connective superiority is a, is a big deal now because it's running our world. You know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Google, Tencent, QQ, whatever. Right? So this concept applied to education could result in this sound. Right? It's a sucking sound of the siren servers, the likes of possibly the Khan Academy and others, sucking up education just like they sucked up publishing and news and, and media and music and travel and tourism. This is a silent server. Sorry, I could not find a better image with a guy, but... Right. Can you please explain a bit more about the silent server? Yes. I have no idea. 
the, the image is actually, this is the image, right? You know what a siren is, right? It's allegedly a, a tale of a woman who sits on a rock and, and, and looks beautiful and sings a nice song and all the sailors drive against the rock because they love her. That's the siren tale. So now on the internet we have these beautiful places that are playing a beautiful song and, and we're all driving in there. We're all being stuck in there. I mean, there's 1.2 billion people on Facebook. Yeah, I like Facebook, so I'm not saying anything bad with that. Just okay. So we have to consider this if this idea of a siren server, for example, in, in public and in, in print, you know, Kodak had 100,000 employees <coughs> and went bankrupt. Instagram, was bought, bought by Facebook, had 12 employees. It was sold for $1.2 billion. <coughs> Spotify, that you may know, compared to a CD, musicians are getting zero money from Spotify. That's just not big enough. But it's a substitute. Not to call Spotify a silent circle. I love Spotify. But the principle, how would that apply to education, to knowledge business? Will companies start doing this for free because they get attract people for another purpose? The purpose of, of uh, Facebook is not to connect us. I mean, this is our purpose of Facebook. Right? The Facebook is to get us in for advertising. This is the objective of Facebook. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, that's just that's the deal that we made. So this is something to think about. I think the monster is kind of like, if you don't pay, you are the content. This is the learning from the last 10 years. So apply this to education. You could argue education is free, then I'm the content of education. I mean, in fact, we are the content of Facebook. Without your shows, I wouldn't be watching. So it's an interesting business model there. The question I'm having is, uh, is this sustainable? is that we become the content for each other. And we're creating these huge hubs that are dishing us up to each other. Is that truly sustainable? And the question I have about authority. If this is us, you know, trying to get a degree or to learn something, we have on the left side the formal authority, the formal certification, and on the right side we have this tempting wave of networked, self-made, self-earned authority. I mean, I'm the best example of this. I went to a music school when I went to, uh, before that I went to study theology when I was 20. Uh, I finished music school, but I didn't finish the other. I don't have a PhD or so, so I, I'm, I'm an example of this you know, self-earned authority <laughs> that I have to live with. But the question is, is there a way between those two? I think there is. It's not either or. But this will not be an easy path. Because on this end, it's free. It's sort of peer-to-peer -peer promoted. It's very powerful. It's also very noisy. Would you hire a guy that is from Kazakhstan, who has 47 certificates in engineering of various things that he's earned on the internet, and will cost you $1,000? Or would you hire an MIT guy, who may also be from Kazakhstan, but he has a certificate and he gets $10,000? Well, the future source will probably hire both in some different ways, but clearly that is sort of the task that we're going on. So again, it's about balance. We're facing the people formerly known as students. <laughs> this is definitely our reality, because they're not, in this case, they're also participants. Right? They're contributors also. And the question is, what would a, a, a truly global brain look like as a result of this flow of information that we're seeing? So, Basically, I think what we're seeing here on this pyramid that's actually quite old as well, but is that we're seeing that essentially we're moving up the pyramid of saying data, information, and knowledge to some degree is just there. It's somehow commoditized, right? But wisdom and intelligence, I think that there's a machine cutoff point at this point. You know? There's a certain point where the machine cuts off and says, I can't produce this wisdom for the time being. Yuri will tell us more about that. But this is a crucial di distinction, of course, as we're moving from downloads to flows, for example, on the Kindle, we don't own the book. We flow into it, we flow out of it. And it enables us to take 150 books on our, on, our, on our trip. In fact, I've been reading sort of horizontally across all those books, which would be hard to do with real books, you know, you have to carry a lot of books. I'm sure you do the same. So, this is a substantial amount of information hitting us, possibly drowning us in an ocean of possibilities. 
if this is what's going to happen with education, I'm not interested. Because in the end, when we're all drowning, who's going to pull us out? How are we going to make a difference? As I was looking for this, I found this nice illustration saying, we're drowning information, but a start for knowledge. And I would add, we're start for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Our knowledge, to some degree, is an input to, related to, to, uh, to data, of course. And this, and this slide that I also found on Tumblr, one of my favorite places, <coughs> kind of illustrates from Wikipedia, actually. What is happening is, is that we're, we're moving from data and information to knowledge, which is a little bit more connected, to connecting the dots and making it actually matter, making sense. My view is that education is moving in this sector, not in this sector. It will always have to supply that, but this is something that we can do in many places, you know, data and information. <coughs> do we really need to learn all that data and memorize it? I think we can safely say that we're moving into this triangle here. I found some stuff on this on Twitter, very interesting. Uh, Martin Wasowski is a friend, he says, spending a lot of time on Twitter makes him more informed, but less knowledgeable. And this guy says, relating too much information with not enough time devoted to connecting the dots, lots of force feeding, little digestion. <coughs> so this is part of the consequence. So if we think of ourselves like this, you know, I think it's a rather limited view of brain power. You know, think of them as a, as a, as a processor. Can you slide that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. So anyway, you know the movie, she flies the helicopter after, after having downloaded the program. Is that the future that we're going? I think ultimately, it's a great example of machine thinking. Like we have right now, you know, with the debate about uh, privacy of data and stuff, we're sort of moving, removing the privacy so we can get a perfect security. There's no better example than machine thinking than this. The, the thinking is, when I'm completely stripped of privacy, I'm completely secure. And both of it is utter bullshit, of course. So machine thinking is leading us in this direction and is essentially creating these scenarios. Now, um, Marshall McLuhan already said this in the 70s. He said, first we build the tools, then they build us. And it's something to think about when we think about technology and what that means. I have to come to the end, so I'm just going to uh, skip ahead a little bit and uh, do a wrap-up so that we don't keep you busy all day here. Sorry about this. You know, as you can see, I was vastly optimistic uh, about the time here. But uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I have big plans for the future. I, uh, I plan to study at the National Intelligence University and there is a, uh, in, in Washington. And there's a great program I tend, intend to enroll in called the Denial and Deception Advanced Studies Program. Uh, and this is part of the education that we can enjoy these days. I'm just kidding, this is just an example. Yeah, but, okay, sorry, that's, I, I really have to move on now. Okay. Um, okay. Coming to the final point. I think technology is great and it will definitely change the way that we look at education and we have to merge from this idea of being you know, in an ecosystem to an ecosystem. That's obvious. There's, and there's great things happening here. What is going to be system failure for me is to replace what we can do in a system of connected people with machines that don't have any ethics. You know, technology does not have ethics. That's machines. I think that no matter what is going to happen with what we do here, the question is ultimately what are our ethics about using the machines and rather than the reverse. And to be sustainable, that's part of it, right? Because machine thinking often forces a short-term focus. And that's a problem with <coughs> what we have here. So five takeaways. We're in a knowledge revolution. A knowledge revolution and, and a data revolution. But what about wisdom? Are we in a wisdom revolution? That's really what we want, ultimately, because that is really what's going to change things. There's a new biosphere and an ecosystem for learning, okay, where Knowledge as well as wisdom is emerging. And this is really what we have to build, a new ecosystem. Just like the publishers have to build one for their magazines and the music guys have to do one for that, and so on and so on. The car companies have to think about electric self driving cars. Right? We have to build a new ecosystem. 
Smart machine software AI will play a huge role, but we shouldn't think like machines because of what we have. And that's, that's a significant danger when you think about how we're growing up with this. Machines essentially completely relying on them, so very soon we can't go for a walk without Google Maps. So machine thinking is definitely a trap. Deep learning, in my view, will never be entirely detachable from the body and experiences and immersion. That doesn't mean we can't work in other ways. We will, and we are. But it's not detachable from actual physical experience. And after we face technology disruption and expansion, we will face ethics as the number one issue. That's really the issue we should be thinking about to build a sustainable human race. This, I think, is the most powerful graph. Okay. We're going to move down here. At least that's my contention. I'll discuss it with you. Thanks very much for your time.